Broadcom stock is expensive. It's not a value. It's certainly not cheap like it was two years ago, almost two years ago when we started recording these videos and it was crazy. This thing was trading at single digit forward multiples, dirt cheap. It's not dirt cheap anymore. Hey everybody, welcome back to Chipstock Investor. In a previous video, we talked about NVIDIA's Blackwell GPU and Broadcom's new XPU, a custom designed application specific integrated circuit. And as promised, we're gonna delve into the software side of Broadcom's business today and discuss why the software segment is also a fantastic investment in AI. Yeah, yeah, we are. Your live in the flesh, hosts, not AI generated, not robots. We're just kind of chill, normal people. Casey's chill. Casey's a chill, normal person. Sometimes I do talk like a robot though. Here's where we left off. Two high growth markets currently at work propelling this big AI hype cycle or whatever you want to call it. You have the brand new AI training or AI factories, as Jensen Wong likes to call them, brand new data centers purpose built for training AI. Maybe that's worth $1 trillion in global worth and global value at some point, but that's going to take some time, at least five years or more to get there. Then you have the existing data centers out there, which need brand new hardware. They need accelerated compute hardware. Many of them will get retrofitted with some new GPUs, uh, new networking equipment from NVIDIA, from Broadcom and others to perform AI inference. That global value of the existing data center footprint currently in existence already at $1 trillion roughly. So those are the two markets propelling this. But let's delve into the software. In the last video on Broadcom, we talked about all those total semiconductor sales, everything on top of the 7.4 billion in sales in Q1 fiscal 2024. But let's talk about infrastructure software there at the bottom. Last quarter, $4.6 billion, 2.1 billion of that from VMware. And here's what that looks like, generally speaking, from this slide that Broadcom put together. In red there on the pie chart, their semiconductor sales, infrastructure software in blue. So roughly 60-40 mix at this point. And that infrastructure software is used for running mainframes, distributed uh, network infrastructure and management, cybersecurity, storage and compute, also some cloud infrastructure. But just to back up one more time to our slide, notice that software revenue expected to be 20 billion. That's the full year guidance from Broadcom, from CEO Hock Tan. You can see for the full year, that implies some growth, some quarterly sequential growth from the 4.6 billion just reported. So we're looking at the software segment in the coming quarters reaching and exceeding $5 billion in quarterly sales. Good stuff here. VMware, a really nice acquisition for Broadcom in its portfolio. Broadcom has a long history of acquisitions. You can take a look at this timeline chart that Broadcom has provided. In 2016, Broadcom and Avago merged. And before that, a lot of hardware acquisitions up until that point. But after 2016, you can see Brocade, CA Technologies, Symantec, VMware, mostly software companies that have been the target of acquisitions for Broadcom. Yeah, that's right. The first big one there, Brocade, uh, which is a specialist in storage and networking products included in there was some software, but uh, a lot of hardware with that one. But then really the software is where things started to make a shift. And at the time, CEO Hock Tan uh, and, and the company, it took some heat from the market because CA Technologies was an infrastructure software company, pure and simple. And in particular, one that specialized in mainframe management software, IBM mainframes. This seemed like a really odd fit for a semiconductor business. But as the years have gone by, a Broadcom has built not a high growth software business, but a highly profitable and slow growth, but highly profitable software empire, Symantec, the enterprise security segment of that, 
and the rest of it is now part of Gen Digital. VMware acquisition completed at the end of calendar year 2023. How does VMware fit in so well with Broadcom's current portfolio? So the overall umbrella rationale for VMware was Broadcom wanted to offer its customers an alternative to the big cloud computing infrastructure providers, your Amazon AWS's, your Microsoft Azure's, Google Cloud, more recently Oracle Cloud. And so you've got the semiconductor business, especially with its big giant networking segment. And now on top of that, let's layer in the infrastructure software needed to run those networking devices. VMware builds on that. Their basic most used core application is creating virtual machines, either in the cloud or it could be a private data center or on-prem device. But basically what that does is it takes a big server, a giant, powerful computer, not totally unlike the computers, the PCs that we use at home, but these things are a lot bigger. They have a lot of powerful capabilities. But when you're talking about a data center, you have a lot of users that are all going to tap the compute power of that single machine. So the InfoWet is called a hypervisor that takes that single server and creates multiple virtual machines that can run different applications and various users can all share the compute power of that single server. So you can see how that differs from our PCs, our personal computer that we use ourselves, but data centers with those powerful engines in them can be provisioned out to lots of different users running lots of different applications. So that's how VMware layers on top of what Broadcom traditionally does with networking chips. You can take a look at this release that Broadcom provided after the acquisition of VMware in November of 2023. The acquisition was made via roughly half stock and half cash for a total of $70 billion. The balance sheet for Broadcom after this acquisition, cash and short-term investments at $11.9 billion. Total liabilities now include $79 billion, which is the total debt as of February 2024. You can see that illustrated very well in one of our charts from Main Street Data. You can see that big bar at the end there. Broadcom did not have the cash available to make that acquisition of VMware. So now you can see that in the balance sheet as debt. It's definitely going to be a priority to get that debt down. And here's one of the ways that Broadcom is drumming up some of that cash to pay down the debt. You can see this press release from KKR, a global investment firm, that they purchased part of the end user computing division from Broadcom after that VMware acquisition. This was not part of the core segment of VMware, as you can see from this release. This sale was roughly $4 billion to Broadcom. They can put towards that debt. Here was the next order of business after the VMware acquisition. And we think this is going to eventually lead to another sale for Broadcom to raise more cash. But as of this recording, no word on that yet, but another non-core asset of VMware was Carbon Black. VMware had acquired Carbon Black a few years ago that is an endpoint cybersecurity product. Broadcom already had some endpoint cybersecurity via that acquisition of Symantec back in 2019. So what they did was they grabbed Carbon Black from VMware, combined it with the Symantec endpoint cybersecurity business to create a new hybrid cloud cybersecurity and endpoint security product group. We're not sure how this is going to work out, but because they already got rid of the endpoint user product to KKR, it seems like endpoint cybersecurity is also going to be deemed another non-core asset to Broadcom's networking, overall networking and cloud strategy. But we'll see. Let's jump to our own cybersecurity industry flowchart just to further illustrate why we think this is. So they have Symantec cybersecurity. Much of that enterprise cybersecurity falls into the physical location, private data center and network, and maybe a little bit cloud cybersecurity products, but Carbon Black added to the little bit of Symantec endpoint security falls into the right side of the chart, mobile devices. And that endpoint cybersecurity resides on things like PCs, smartphones, other endpoint devices that a business might have at the edge of the network. 
And those products are going to be in competition with the big heavyweights in endpoint security. CrowdStrike, Microsoft has a bunch in endpoint. Sentinel One, we think, think Broadcom will whittle down its list of services to focus, especially on its private data center and private cloud and a little bit of public cloud services software and possibly offload that segment to raise more cash. Historically, VMware was not exactly blowing the doors off the software business. It was actually pretty mundane. Why do we expect that VMware will have more success under the Broadcom umbrella? Yeah, this was an interesting and surprising, in a good way, aspect of the last earnings update when Hawk Tan said pretty early in the earnings call that if VMware is going to contribute to double-digit percentage sequential growth through the rest of this fiscal year. He elaborated, this is simply a result of their strategy with VMware. They're focused on upselling their existing customers, particularly those who are already running their compute workloads with uh, vSphere virtualization tools. That's that little graph that, that we put together to show you how a hypervisor splits up and provisions the compute power of a server to upgrade those customers to the VMware Cloud Foundation or VCF. So it's a complete software stack that takes compute, storage, and networking, virtualizes all of it for their clients' data centers, both on-prem and for public cloud purposes. In, in addition to this, Tan also mentioned the partnership with NVIDIA to build on that VCF product with Private AI Foundation. We wrote about this last summer. We'll put a link to that article if you don't know what the Private AI Foundation is. But in all of these data centers that we mentioned at the outset of this video in need of upgrading so that they can handle especially AI inference workloads. You upgrade your data center, be it in the cloud or your own personal private data center, doesn't matter. You upgrade the hardware, but you, you need software now to run and operate that data center. And so that's where Broadcom comes in with its new networking chips and now also the enterprise software from VMware to help those customers operate the GPUs that they might be purchasing from NVIDIA, as well as those from Broadcom, like its new application-specific XPU that we talked about a couple of days ago. So backing up to this quote again, you can see Hawk Tan very clearly running this business like a private equity firm and trying to consolidate customer relationships to VMware, to Broadcom, create a, a full vertically integrated business from chips to software. And that's clearly leading to this expectation for VMware to suddenly, as you said, Casey, start to actually blow the doors off of results instead of this really pedestrian, boring business that it was before. However, not everything is all sunshine and rainbows under the Broadcom umbrella for VMware. Notice this blog post that CEO Hawk Tan made just recently. In the third paragraph, you can see some of the changes they've made. They've, he says they've overhauled the software portfolio, go-to-market approach, and the overall organizational structure. We've changed how and through whom we will sell our software. And we've completed the software business model transition that began to accelerate in 2019 from selling perpetual software to subscription licensing only, which is the industry standard. And then he addresses some of the complaints from customers. He says, we recognize that this level of change has understandably created some unease among our customers and partners. But all of these moves have been with the goals of innovating faster, meeting our customers' needs more effectively, and making it easier to do business with us. We also expect these changes to provide greater profitability and improved market opportunities for our partners. This overhaul that Broadcom is talking about is with the software partners. As Nick mentioned earlier, CEO Hawk Tan is definitely geared towards the private equity mentality. And so he's shaking things up in order to encourage customers to migrate more of their workloads over to VMware versus competitive offerings from other businesses. Smaller VMware partners have been unhappy and some of the larger partners have been unhappy with the short-term patch of lumping smaller partners under the larger partner licenses for the time being. 
because big partners don't want to have to offer the customer support to the smaller partners. Yeah, this is a messy process. You can see again from the financials, the VMware contributing, at least here in the next year, this nice little growth bump for the overall enterprise software division. We don't know what that's going to look like going forward, though. We expect the enterprise software segment to settle back into a low single digit growth rate as we get into fiscal year 2025. This is not uncharted territory, though, if you're a Broadcom investor. When they acquired Symantec back in 2019, a very similar thing happened where Broadcom just started up and ending its license agreement with small software partners for cybersecurity. And at the time, right, CrowdStrike's CEO, George Kurtz, in true George Kurtz fashion, called out Broadcom's moves as benefiting CrowdStrike as a lot of those smaller Symantec partners just migrated on over to CrowdStrike. Broadcom, more than happy to allow that to happen. They are focused not on all-out growth and maximizing revenue. They're about maximizing profit. Very different strategy. In acquiring VMware, Broadcom wanted to offer some alternatives to the big cloud software providers. But similarly to how you hear a lot of these big software companies, Google, Meta, Amazon, take your pick. Sometimes those companies end up in hot water with regulators. Broadcom may have that same potential for regulation and scrutiny. So something to be mindful of. You can see this news from the Register EuroCloud Consortium CISPE calls for investigation of Broadcom based on those VMware licensing arrangements. Yeah, that's right. So a, a lot of smaller customers not happy and probably for good reason. It's a big disruption to their operation that they didn't ask for. And that was one of the big reasons why Broadcom plus VMware got so much regulatory scrutiny in the year plus leading up to the merger in late 2023. At any rate, that's where we're at. The big takeaway though here for investors in particular is Broadcom with its leading networking and application specific custom chip design department, definitely a leader in this new emerging AI infrastructure field chip industry. Now you've got all the infrastructure software that you need to operate that new infrastructure that you've just installed. Is Broadcom a top player in this market? The answer is absolutely yes. It is emerging as one of the leaders in this market alongside NVIDIA. Both have come to this same business model from different directions. NVIDIA largely built its hardware plus software business organically. Broadcom via lots of acquisitions over the years. But the end result is, is essentially the same. You have a hardware plus software business vertically integrated, powering this AI market. Really, really great business model for investors. Okay, Nick, time to talk about valuation for this mega company, Broadcom. Based on March 27, 2024, share price of $1,330, market cap right around $615 billion, enterprise value of $680 billion. Tell me about your valuation notes. Yeah, if we look at this on a trailing 12-month basis, you can see those valuations are definitely stretched. Almost 50 times trailing 12-month earnings is a high price tag, especially for a company with so much debt on balance that you outlined earlier, even on a free cash flow basis or an or enterprise value to free cash flow basis, which includes that debt on balance. It's a high price tag. A couple of things though, integrating VMware into the enterprise software unit is, it's not going to be easy. It's going to take time, a couple of years for it to fully integrate and for Broadcom to get the profit margins back up to where they like to see them, north of 60% adjusted EBITDA margins. So that's the expectation. That's why the market has allowed this valuation to get to overvalued territory on a trailing 12 month basis. It's because the expectation is Broadcom pays off lots of debt in the next couple of years and also increases those VMware profit margins along the way. So let's take a look at what the market expectation is and try to figure out what the market is maybe has as a consensus expectation for Broadcom right now to warrant that price tag of over 600 billion market cap, almost 700 billion enterprise value. Here's what we came up with. Using the trailing 12-month free cash flow per share of 
just over $42. We think the market is looking for free cash flow per share growth of about 20% on average over the next three years, and then a 5% terminal growth rate after that. We plugged in a discount rate of 10%, or roughly, we think the S&P 500 will average over the long term 10%. That gets us to about that fair value of $1,300. So now it's a reverse DCF calculation. That's not our actual expectation for what Broadcom will do. This is kind of how we approach valuation and then see, okay, this is the market consensus expectation. Is it reasonable? I think given that VMware is only just one quarter into its integration with Broadcom, the free cash flow per share growth rate of 20% over the next three years looks ridiculous. It looks like an absurd expectation. Just adding VMware into the mix alone, you could see from our original slide earlier on the financials, infrastructure software sales up over 150% compared to last year because of VMware getting added into the mix. So we actually don't think the free cash flow growth rate of 20% over the next three years is all that absurd. And then a 5% terminal growth value after that, that's basically in line with the broad IT industry overall. It's revenue growth rate of 5%. Broadcom stock is expensive. It's not a value. It's certainly not cheap like it was two years ago, almost two years ago when we started recording these videos and it was crazy. This thing was trading at single digit forward multiples, dirt cheap. It's not dirt cheap anymore. But we actually do think this is a reasonable expectation for Broadcom going forward. And we think this thing is probably still closer to fair value than not. So we're happy to continue holding our stock and think that if you're looking for a top AI software and especially infrastructure management software bet on this new AI market, it's going to be difficult to find something significantly better than Broadcom at this juncture. In our opinion, we're more than happy to continue holding on to our shares. And maybe at some point later this year, we'll nibble again on Broadcom stock. All right. That wraps up our two video series on Broadcom this week. We have much more coming your way. Stay tuned for a video on pure storage. And we still have to talk about digital ocean. Make sure you hit that subscribe button if you have not done so already. Check out our links in the description that we referenced in the video. And you can find our Kofi shop with all of our video notes and our cybersecurity industry manual for 2024. Or you can always join the membership here on YouTube or over on Kofi, and that gets you access to our Discord channel. And those manuals are included in the monthly membership. And just for our Discord members, we will be having a live event again over there on the Discord channel, a Q&A session. So that's another benefit you get with that membership live events where you can ask Nick anything and me some things. All right, we'll see you again soon at Chipstock Investor.